All right, we're here today with uh, Mr. Gerald Gentis. Uh, it's October 22nd, 2007. He was a B-17 tail gunner, flew 30 missions in Europe. He was a member of the 385th Bomb Group, 548th Squadron of the 8th Air Force. And uh, I guess the first thing I'd like to ask you is, where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Well, I was in high school. I was a senior in high school, and my little job at, as extra was to take care of any films or radio uh, presentations that uh, would come up. So it was naturally for me to set up a radio system on the auditorium so we could hear uh, President Roosevelt's uh, declaration of war the next morning. Uh, so I was still in school and uh, uh, I didn't uh, I graduated in the following May of 42. So, as you graduated, what did you do after that? I, after I graduated, I kind of loafed around a little bit trying to decide just what I wanted to, what part of the service I was really going to go into. I knew I was going to go in the Air Force, but uh, a little hesitant just for a while. But in uh, uh, November of 42, uh, I joined the Air Force uh, cadets, went into cadets, and I uh, was called in, in in December of uh, uh, 42. Uh, from there, uh, went through the natural procedures after going in, uh, going through cadet uh, basics and getting militarized. And uh, then I was assigned to uh, Amarillo Air Force Base as a cadet in our assignment there was to go to uh, Amarillo Junior College as a, uh, a pre-flight. Uh, but the air base was so new and the uh, college was uh, not equipped yet. So to rush things along, they uh, washed us out. Uh, and we were in class 44D and uh, they washed us out and gave us the next best thing that was available right then. And so I went through A&E at Amarillo Air Base and completed that in about, I believe it was something like uh, 13, 13 months. Uh, at that time, then I was, and why I don't know, I was sent to uh, Larry Field at Denver, Colorado, an armament school. Uh, that consisted of all phases of aircraft armament, uh, aircraft uh, uh, types of aircraft that used whatever they needed. Uh, completed that, and um, the next real quick run to um, Kingman, Arizona, and there are used. Um, Every type of a, of a weapon that I had learned about at armament school, uh, plus being aerial gunnery. That's going up uh, and simulating uh, flights into enemy territory with fighters and all. And uh, that took a route five, something like five months to complete. Uh, the top three percent in that gunnery class was automatically transferred into the 8th Air Force. For some other reason, uh, the uh, bombardiers were getting scarce uh, in combat evidently, so they sent the 3% of us down to uh, Yuma for a briefing on being a toggleer, which is an enlisted bombardier. After that short six weeks, they uh, sent us to McNeil Field at Tampa, Florida. Uh, I had to delay en route on, on that. So um, at Tampa, we were assigned uh, to a crew, a combat crew, uh, 10 men to a crew on, of course, B-17s. Uh, we went to um, 
Gulfport, Mississippi for our RTU training. That's that reserve training units for, for the Air Force, 8th Air Force. Uh, that didn't take very long. Uh, next we went to um, uh, Savannah, Georgia. We were to pick up a brand new 17 to fly over. But as luck would have it, uh, as uh, the pilots uh, alphabet order, uh, our pilots was uh, R for Richie, and uh, when they got down to within seven of the last seven groups or crews, they didn't have any airplanes. It wasn't going to be a while before they would get more, so they rushed us up on train to Cape Kilmer, New Jersey. Um, stayed there one night, and then you no, know, stayed there the second uh, night and a half because the next night. They put us on a ferry and took us to the Brooklyn shipyards. And at the pier, there was two great ships on each side of a pier. Uh, one was the Queen Elizabeth and one was the Queen Mary. And uh, we didn't know where we, who we were going. So just seven crews of us went up, went aboard the Queen Mary. And there were 20,000 infantry on board already. So they evidently were waiting for us to get up there to to uh, to leave. And the next morning, or the next, yeah, the next morning, we uh, we left New York Harbor. And uh, four days later, we were in Greenwich, Scotland. And that Queen Mary did not have an escort; didn't have to be into a convoy or anything. They were too fast. Every five minutes, they would change course, zigzag, so that uh, a sub couldn't get a bearing on us. So we went into um, Scotland, and then by real fast rail, we went down to um, Eccleshaw uh, for um, um, bomb group assignment. We were time we got there, they had already assigned us to the 385th. So we turned right around the next evening, and by night, train went to Great Ashfield, which is about 20 miles northwest of Ipswich, a little town called Elmswell. And there was where Great Ashfield, that's where we were stationed, uh, more or less, for the rest of the war, the uh, rest of the war in Europe. When I went over, we were told we could fly 25 missions and then we could rotate back home. Well, as uh, time went on, the, I guess the odds of completing your missions were starting to spread. So uh, sometime about December of uh, 44, they upped it to uh, 30 missions. And then your odds got a little bit better, and by March the 1st of 45, that you have to have 35 missions before you could rotate. But the war ended in May the 5th, and uh, so I had 29 uh, actual combat missions. The uh, Germans had stripped Holland of all foods. Uh, there were, people were starving to this, so we stripped out a few of the B-17s of armament and loaded down with food and flew food missions. Uh, my bomb group, I think, flew four missions. I flew. I got to fly two. Um, the uh, first mission we flew in to um, Holland. There was a field. It was a big soccer field and we would fly down real low and drag the field to be sure everything was just fine and we, where we could unload our food and then the, make another pass and drop the food. It, we did that by flying wheels down, flaps down, high RPM on our engines to keep our airspeed up and, uh, and get as slow as we could possibly get before so we would stall out. And then we dropped our food. And as we did, the, uh, a holdout, a German holdout with a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun uh, opened fire on us. 
it, well, it didn't hurt us, but it punched some holes in us. So I got my 30th combat mission, you know, the 30th being after fire was supposed to stop. And um, the rest of the food missions were just uh, routine then, from then on. So that kind of takes care of my combat. After the food uh, flights, some of the different squadrons were assigned to maybe go down into Poland or, or down into Romania or somewhere in that area to some of those prison camps and fly the prisoners of war back into France or wherever they were supposed to go. By June the 1st, they, we had been given the notice that we were going to return home, but some of the other bomb groups were going to be uh, given uh, occupation. We had been uh, in, in uh, we went in one time to uh, Nuremberg uh, after one of the food drops and were scouting the um, air base there to see what was needed uh, if we were going to get occupation because they at first thought all of the 3rd Division would probably get occupation and the 1st and 2nd Division uh, of the 8th would go home. Well, we were 3rd Division. So anyway, we were then elected to go home and we started preparations and took our regular crew. I had been assigned a new crew. Um, at that time, I, I, I didn't have a crew. My crew had gone down in the North Sea uh, April the 4th in a mid-air collision. Uh, both aircraft were uh, destroyed and all 20 men went into the North Sea. No one was rescued. So I was uh, a loner. So I was assigned another crew temporarily just to come back to the States. Um, we then loaded up with all of our personal uh, equipment plus 10 ground personnel and their personal uh, possessions and flew back to um, uh, in Connecticut we f was our goal. We flew from Great Ashfield to um, Wales, from Wales to Reykjavik, uh, Iceland, from Iceland to BW1, which is Bluey, Bluey West 1, Greenland, and from Greenland then into uh, um, uh, Connecticut. Now it's given them 30 days uh, leave and um, then at the end of the 30 days I was to report to Sioux Falls, South Dakota for a reassignment. Whenever I got to Sioux Falls uh, this would probably about the 20, well, it was 26th or 27th, I don't know, maybe it was right about my birthday, the 28th of, of July. Uh, I did I was there and I left and I got in, into uh, Sioux Falls in about a day. So they needed a CFC, which is Sense of Fire Controller, uh, on a B-29 crew that uh, had a vacancy. And the air, aircraft is down at Amarillo for a final checkout. So they rushed me down there and uh, I met a new crew and I was very explicit about, well I don't know a thing in the world about CFC, um, but the pilot was very, co very cooperative, he says, hands me an armload of, of uh, manuals and everything and he says, now we're going to be leaving here in about two or three days. We got two flights to make with this aircraft and then we're going to go out to Travis, pick up Bombay tanks and they're going to fly non-stop to Saipan uh, and we're going to be out there real quick. 
So by the time we get out there, you'll know all about being a CFC. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I got to fly B-29 twice. Uh, they were slow timing it, be sure everything was okay with it because it was new from Wichita. And uh, the day before we were to go to Travis, they dropped the first bomb. Then they dropped the second bomb. And then they dropped us. Uh, we, they just says, forget about it, you're not going anywhere, you're, you're here. Um, they'll, uh, headquarters will find a position here for you until you're eligible for um, discharge. So uh, I spent that rex that time until about November uh, of 45 waiting for my service record to show up and it never did. And uh, so I spent my time as a sergeant major of a technical training squadron. Uh, this, the CO of the squadron, as luck would have it, uh, had been a PE uh, officer when I went to school there a couple of years before. And he had been acquired um, as CO, which is in a captain's rating. He immediately recognized me, and uh, so, uh, like I say, I had, I got to be assigned to the uh, sergeant major of the squadron, and with his help, after about three months of pestering headquarters, <laughs> they said, let me be discharged with a, um, a deposition of um, all of my service records because my service record was lost and they didn't know where it was. So that covers that pretty good of it. Okay, well I've got some questions. If, right. if you don't mind, I could go back and touch on some things. All right. <clears throat> um, why did you get involved in the Air Force? What made you think you wanted to go in the Air Force? Um, I had been raised in the Air Force. Um, my dad was in the, was in the um, Signal Corps in World War One. I have a picture of him over there. He was uh, stationed at uh, Indianapolis uh, Speedway, and they had their air base and the infield. And he was a uh, a pilot. Che he checked out pilots, um, to, uh, let them just like soloing and everything like that. So that's what he did. He was a, an instructor, pilot instructor in World War One. Uh, after the war. Um, he worked in the oil fields, and then he had he worked with the Seminole Air Service, flying uh, um, OX-5 Wacos in the Seminole Oil Well Servicing Group, and he'd been in the flying business for a long time. And I had been doing everything in, I could to fly. As a matter of fact, uh, I got involved up with a fellow named Johnny Armstrong up at uh, Commercial Airport back in the late 30s. On my 16th birthday, I got my pilot's license. Uh, I had soloed, and uh, I had then got my driver's license. So within a week, I had my pilot's license and driver's license. So I have been in flying all my life. I understand that my first flight, they took me up in a, a old tri-motor Ford. Uh, I don't know how old I was, but I don't remember. But anyway, uh, I have been flying ever since, since then. And I've just recently um, sold my Cessna, and I had it kept, kept it here at home. I had my own airstrip, and uh, I figured it's time I kind of slowed down the flying a little bit. Not only that, uh, liability insurance is getting too high for somebody on a fixed income. <laughs> So anytime I, uh, and I still fly, the only thing, um, uh, my medical isn't active right now, the only thing I have to do is go get it reactivated, but I have a friend that has um, a flying school up here at Riverside, and she has her, her and her husband, and uh, they have quite a few aircraft, and I, whenever I want to go fly, I go up and I can lease a plane from her. She and I had... Um, been associated in the same uh, flying group up there on the uh, at Riverside 
quite a while back, whenever she first started doing her instructing. And um, so uh, I'm still, I still get my, my wings out every once in a while and dust them off. <laughs> what was it like? How did you meet your crew? Like, you know, what, how did the process go for you, you know, the 10 guys to get together? Did you all meet at the same time? We you uh, together or did you get put together? We were put together. Uh, we, that's why we went to McDill Field. Uh, I went down there. Um, the courses was for all of them. They just kind of bring a whole lot of, of groups together and uh, uh, assemble them there. And how they got us together, I haven't the slightest idea. Um, they, uh, it, it took about three weeks, and I got to fly uh, a sub patrol uh, in a B-17 out over the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and I thought, well, that's probably what I'm going to do uh, for a while. But anyway, that was just something to do. They give us each one of us, you know. But how they assigned each one of us uh, together. I don't know, maybe it was by lottery or, or whatever. But uh, I had a real good crew, very good. Um, I don't remember where all of them were from. Uh, I know the radio operator was from ba Bangor, Maine. I remember that. My, and my ball turret gutter was from uh, uh, Macon, Mississippi. Uh, my uh, one of my waist gutters was from uh, New York. The other one was from um, Idaho. Um, let's see. Um, the the we didn't have a bombardier uh, at all uh, assigned to us, uh, but our navigator was from. Um, Let's see, the navigator was from someplace in, in, in Carolinas. And the engineer was from uh, uh, Virginia. So it was odd how it's kind of a odd grouping, you know. Mm -hmm. But boy, we all got along real well. And That's great. Once in a while, we would, we would get assigned a bombardier when we got into combat. If we were flying lead ship, we'd have to. We'd have to have a commissioned officer as bombardier. Uh, that's when I would, if I fly with my crew, that's when I would fly a tail. Uh, when I would fly with other crews, I'd be flying as a toggle uh, The wingmen on, on, off of each lead ship uh, were toggle uh, We would get basically the same briefing as the bombardier if we were going to be a, a bombardier that day. Um, so. We were not assigned a permanent uh, bombardier because we would, wouldn't be flying lead all the time. So if you were flying lead, you had one. And uh, then I never flew as toggle with my crew. We were always uh, had a full crew like that. But I've flown about half of my missions with other crews as a toggle one little instance, well, let's put it this way, there's two instances that uh, shows a little quirks about combat. Uh, the first little quirk was that I never got a scratch my whole career. I've come so close on one of the missions, I was flying in tail of our crew, and flak gus was the results uh, of 60% of our casualties anyway. Fighters weren't, weren't that much. Uh, we were pretty well armed. But flak is something that you couldn't dodge. You, it, you didn't know where it was going to be. It had a flak burst real close and uh, it, it just shook us. Uh, it hit so close. And I thought, well, something hit hit me and I thought, well, what, what was that that hit me? And what it was is a piece of flak and I kept it for a long time. It came through into the tail uh, through the, from, the, uh, from my left, which is, would be from the right of the, if you're going the other way, mm -hmm. and come down across and cut my, uh, the uh, parachute harness, cut a couple of straps on that and then fell there and just right around. I picked it up a little later. 
and uh, but I'm sure glad I didn't have to bail out on any time that time especially because I had to piggyback with somebody but um, it didn't cut my my oxygen or anything it just cut that chute harness that was one oddity the real oddity of the whole thing and I look back on it every once in a while and I get the cold shivers um, and that's something if you ever talk to anybody that says they, you were not scared when you went on a mission they're a liar or they never were there but you got you shook, and you could sweat at 70 to below zero. Below zero. Uh, that was the temperature we flew at. But uh, we took off, getting ready to take off on this mission to uh, Kiel. I had been on the Kiel with the crew the day before, uh, and we were going back because they were going to lead low echelon. Uh, went down for the briefing and everything, and after the briefing, uh, the load, uh, I don't remember what he was, uh, what, load captain, I think it's what he was, they came in to check the crews and where they all, all positions filled. He came in and asked me if um, I would mind standing down. And I said, well, no. He said, well, you're going back to Kiel, aren't you? Now, yeah. I said, well, I told him, I said, I've been there. I was there yesterday. I don't need to go back today then. He says, well, I'll tell you what. I'll, I'll have you stand down. And uh, I've got a fellow here that uh, needs one more mission uh, to go home with his crew. His crew finished up two or three days before, and he had missed one of the missions. And uh, he wants to go home with him, and he needs one more mission. So... I'll put him in your place if you don't mind. I says, you're the loadmaster. That's all I right, need. So Whitey um, Fredrickson was the fellow's name. I knew him. Um, we knew a few around. We didn't know a lot of people. We never did. No, no crews got too well acquainted. Um, so uh, he went down with the crew in mid-air collision over the North Sea an hour into the mission, and uh, I got to go. I got to go home, and he didn't. But uh, that's one of the odd things. And I look, think back on it every now and then. I thought, boy, that was something. Somebody else was looking out for me beside me, and uh, evidently I had a, I had a calling somewhere else that I hadn't fulfilled yet. So that's that was one of the little rough points. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you can come back and be about four crews staying in a building. You know, it wasn't a concept hut. It was just a, it looked like an old chicken shed or something. You'd let, go out on a mission and come back and there'd be an empty area there where the five or six guys uh, cots were. Uh, you'd you kind of got not used to it, but it, it affects your heart. And then when you get back, and uh, I, I was, I just went out and fooled around on the flight line and said, just to have something to do that day. And I got hurt it about the mid-air collision by being in, close to the radio room out there. And they had radioed that they'd had an accident and all crews were gone, they thought. But to go back then into the to our barracks uh, and see your bedroll and all your clothes gone too, to, to have everybody else, boy, that throws uh, throws a little quirk to you. So, so because you weren't on that mission with your crew, um, you went back to your barracks afterwards, and they rolled yours up too. Oh, they, they had to help. Yeah, they they took all of them as quick as they could, and they knew they were uh, down. Uh, they just took all, all the, all the stuff, foot lockers and everything else. I had to talk like crazy to them. That, that was me out there. I'm here. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, it um, was, it was, it was quite a hairy. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of stuff like that. It's kind of 
you never forget, actually. Mm -hmm. Now, you said you were you were a tail gunner on, on about half your missions? About half of missions, uh-huh. Um, did you ever see any fighters? Did you fire Oh, any? yes, yes. Uh, my uh, uh, ball turret gunner and I teamed up on, on a... Ha we call him hapless because uh, I don't know whether he was really coming at us or not. I don't really think he was, but uh, uh, he didn't. <laughs> so my ball turret gunner and I uh, got us a beat ME-109, yeah. Yeah. Was that the only plane you were able to get, or were yeah, I, I fired. I I had fired at at some uh, the FW 190s when I would be flying uh, toggle air. They'd become a funnel attack, and I'd fire at them. And I don't know where I ever got any or not. But that ME 109, he and I both know we got it because boy, it 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 went down, and it was he was on fire. Mm -hmm. So uh, he'd get four fifth. Uh, 50 calibers on you, <laughs> it's pretty rough. And we were shooting down on him. Now, if he would had turned up, uh, up on a, and showed his underside, uh, he wouldn't have got hit. Uh, we could hit him, but it wouldn't damage him. They were armored pretty well. Oh, really? But we got that because we firing down on it, at him, and got him down. Mm -hmm. We both got a cluster to our air metal over that. So, uh, out of your... 30 missions, um, what was, uh, you know, what was it like in your first mission? I mean, you were probably pretty nervous. Well, I didn't know what to expect. Do you recall the, the name of your plane or anything? Uh, um, no, I flew, uh, I flew three missions uh, before my crew, uh, or even I flew with my crew. Uh, they, uh, they needed a, a tail gunner uh, pretty often. And for some reason, one morning, uh, they woke me up, and uh, I said, "Well, don't my rest of the crew go?" No, no, it's all you're. You're the only one we need now. Uh, that, and I flew, uh, and I don't even remember. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It was that was the morning that they uh, Christmas Eve, uh, the Battle of the Bulge. Um, that was the first day we could fly. We hadn't been able to fly um, two weeks before. Uh, not hardly any flights went out. That morning, Christmas Eve of 44, we flew out and we bombed uh, a staging area. Uh, looked like it must have been about 20 miles from uh, Bastogne, uh, back in toward Germany. And they were m massing more in reinforcements. And uh, that day is when we stopped the Bastogne breakout mm -hmm. because from then on they didn't go anywhere they went backwards mm -hmm. but that was the first day we'd been able to fly in, in about two or three weeks because it sucked in boy it was snow and everything else you know it was a rough winter mm -hmm. but that was that was my first first mission was to go out and uh, uh, help relieve Bastogne and I flew then two more missions, I'd have to look on my schedule. I've, I have finally, after a period of time, have a list of all my missions. And I, but um, anyway, uh, I flew three missions before uh, I, I flew with my crew. Can you tell us about this picture here? Can you hold that up? And... Yeah, this is the picture of uh, the first aircraft that uh, my crew and I were assigned. Uh, we didn't name it or anything. You just inherited what was available. As Mr. Lucky, and it was a B-17G, uh, and it had uh, uh, the chin turret series, and of course it had the uh, uh, the new uh, 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 Cheyenne semi-tail turret. So yeah, that is uh, that aircraft died a horrible death on um, March the first of forty-five. It got hit midship uh, by an ME-110. Uh, they thought the pilot uh, was dead whenever he hit him. And he wasn't one of those suicide things. Uh, but he hit him right in the middle, right, right about the waist gun position, and cut the airplane in two. And the fellow, the armbruster's crew, they were flying it. And... Uh, Joe Jones is the only known person 
and he was the tail gunner uh, that rode a, or flew a B-17 tail down and landed. Uh, naturally, he didn't land it. It spiraled down. It's the backside of that that air of that aircraft. It's bigger than some uh, single-engine aircraft. But uh, when that thing broke up, that engine, uh, that aircraft flew through them. The uh, centrifugal force, and nobody else, nobody else got out alive. Uh, it cut the oxygen, and he used to come up here and tell tell all this about his daughter worked here in Tulsa. But he says I tried to figure out how I'm, how I couldn't get out of there. He says the thing it was even the door where where you have a hatch there for your tail gunner could get out. That thing was even cramped up to where he, he couldn't even kick it loose. He said beside I was running out of oxygen. I couldn't hardly breathe. He said uh, my last resort I was going to try to knock out one of the windows on the side of the tail there and uh, poke my parachute out and see if I could get it as a drag chute, but he said I passed out. And the next thing he knew, he said, I was in a Belgian hospital. Um, and the people, and I've got some pictures of it, the people that uh, saw this tail section, they said it spiraled around just like it was being flown. It spiraled down. It crash landed, and they cut him out with axes and whatever, got him out, and uh, got him to the hospital. I think he said he had a, uh, some rib, broke ribs, and uh, I don't remember where he said he had a um, sprained leg or a broken leg. I don't remember what, but anyway, he was the only one that ever flown a B-17 epinized down and lived to tell about it. What was the altitude that you guys flew at? So what oh, would he have been? Yeah. Um, your, low altitude, your low echelon generally would run about 29,000. Um, your mid about 30, and your top would run about, oh, 31. Uh, we always flew in the mid echelon for some reason. Um, that uh, was most of my missions were from 30 to 32,000, basically. Uh, and it's cold, 70 below zero, and uh, we had electrically heat heated suits. Yeah, the early ones were sheep lined leather, which were no good. Uh, you, uh, you, yeah, you had a lot of frostbite, but those electric heated suits were pretty darn good. H how long was your longest mission? Okay, my longest was 11 hours, and I'm not real sure which one it was, uh, and my shortest one uh, outside of the food mission was nine. So we had a long mission. Nine hours and 70 below. Yeah, well, uh, you took off from your air base, like from Great Asheville, and you had a certain area uh, assigned uh, and an altitude to go to your altitude, and you did all that to bring your aircraft, all of your aircraft that would go on a raid to their assigned altitudes. When they all got to their assigned altitudes, then they were given a signal, and then they would line up and go off. Mm -hmm. So you you flew, circled around and around over England until you got to your altitude, and then you went. So by the time you were at six, 7,000, they always liked for you to go on oxygen about then. Nine, 10,000 was used to be when here in the States, but uh, they were in combat. Get on oxygen, get everything all checked out. And when I flew toggle air, I, I'd have to go back and pull pins uh, on the bombs and put them on my harness to, so I could trade them in for new ones. But anyway, um, everybody then went to their position uh, and uh, stayed there until uh, after the you come back into England. Uh, on takeoff and landings, uh, your crew would, the bombardier and navigator would be, get up behind the pilot and co-pilot, uh, and the engineer would be there. Radio room, you'd have your tail gunner and your two waist gunners and your ball turret gunner in the radio room. That's to get all your weight right in the middle there with your bombs. Center of gravity, so the aircraft could be trimmed up mm -hmm. to take off. Uh, one of the little 
honestly, people don't uh, realize, and I, I've, not, I've noticed this whenever I make the statement, uh, when I'm making my little presentations to these schools, is that you carry uh, 8,000 pounds of bombs. Okay, generally uh, there are 16 500 pounders. Um, when you're briefed uh, before your mission, it, they will tell you you're either going to salvo or you're going to train your bombs off. Salvo means you let them all go um, on a target. Um, if you're going to train them off, they'll, you set your timer on the end of the and that thing will tr trigger the bombs, let them go off one, two, like that. Um, people don't realize that you don't fly a close formation if you're going to salvo your bombs. Because when you let go of 8,000 pounds of bombs, that airplane is going to go up until it equalizes its weight loss. Mm -hmm. And then it'll settle back down. So mm -hmm. you're going to be, uh, if you didn't have your uh, belt on, uh, you'd be uh, free, free floating. So, but uh, even though I'm training their bombs off, you can, you can tell when, when they start going off. You can feel the aircraft kind of... Really? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I've always seen the footage of the bombs going out, you know, down, and you see uh -huh. them kind of doing this. Uh-huh. Did the bombs ever hit and they explode in midair? I mean... I don't... No, I never saw, saw that. Now, I've um, seen a, a, a footage of... Uh, they told us, now, be sure and don't do this. Uh, the bombs are released from one of the aircraft up above, and the fellow below was out of position, and sheared one of his horizontal stabilizers off. Now, I've seen that, and they always say, don't get under your the other aircraft. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it's, yeah, and you fly tight formations. Um, they said that was for protection. Well, I don't know. Uh, I've always disagreed with that, but I'm not, I'm not an expert at it, so I figure that if you're flying tight formation, and you get hit by flak, uh, you're going to not wipe out one airplane, you're going to wipe out two or three if you're flying too damn close. Mm -hmm. So, and then mm, flying close uh, on a fighter attack, um, and that's, that's still hazardous. Uh, I, I like to keep spread out just a little bit. It's mm -hmm. always feel comfortable that you've got 13 50 caliber guns on board that thing. You're going to get fires coming at you, uh, yeah. Um, you can fire at them, your gunners can fire at them up to uh, eight or nine seconds. They can only fire at you on a, when their pursuit curve in, they've only got three to four seconds. They can line up on you and fire and then peel away. So your gunners have got, a, got the advantage, really. Mm -hmm. um, but they did, they did a lot of damage, but really flak is what caused so much of our problems. Mm -hmm. We did get to putting out chaff. That's long mm -hmm. strips of tin foil, and it kind of messed up their radar. Now, their radar wasn't real good. Um, ten tenths coverage, we couldn't see the ground, they couldn't see us. But we'd have a pathfinder leading the group. That would be a, that's a Mickey uh, tr radar. If we were going to be 10 tenths coverage, then we would bomb uh, the togglers, the bombardiers, and all release the bombs whenever he did, because uh, he had the, the target all spotted. Mm -hmm. uh, when they couldn't see us in 10 tenths coverage, uh, if they were to send fighters up or flak or something like that, every once in a while we'd see a P-51 or a B-47 or B-17 or something flying out just out range of our guns uh, and they would be radioing down our altitude, our airspeed and direction of flight and radioing to their gunners down on the ground. So pretty soon you'd see flight up here, up here, down here. They were looking for us and that aircraft would stay out there until that they got pretty close to where they would start to get real close to us, and then he'd peel off and go away. And you said they were in one of our planes? The, yeah, captured one of us, captured our, our aircraft. A lot of times they wouldn't even 
take the markings off and put an iron cross on it or a black cross on it. They just leave the markings on it. Oh yeah, yeah, they used our aircraft against us. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that's what they would uh, they would do if since their radar wasn't that all that good. Mm -hmm. Well, what did you do when you weren't on a mission? What did you do in your downtime on the base? Oh, you know, uh, we'd right. sharpen our our our, our, um, our we're gunners. We could sharpen our our uh, aim by going out. We've got we had a skate range. Uh, we had uh, uh, a big hangar that had a ball turret uh, and a uh, top turret. Uh, and a tail semi-tour, rigged up to where you could uh, do target practice by by uh, light, by you know camera guns and stuff like that. And uh, then if we wanted to uh, uh, and had to, nothing scheduled for us, like uh, we we bought bicycles. First crack out of the box, we went down to, me and another, one of the guys went down to Ipswich and bought us a bicycle. Uh, the only way you could get around in, in England was either train, or sometimes they'd be a bus, uh, somewhere, very few of them, but if you're going someplace like, oh, Barry St. Edmunds or Woolford or someplace like that around, uh, just to look at the scenery or stuff like that, the way you'd ride your bicycle. Either that or get on the train and go to Ipswich or go to London. Um, we'd go to London very seldom. <clears throat> I guess I was in London maybe half a dozen times. That's about all. Mm -hmm. And um, Did you ever hear any, uh, see any of the buzz bombs? Yeah. The V-2s or anything? Yeah, like the V-2s, it was in, uh, we could hear those uh, when we'd go into London, say if we were in there for a day or two. And we'd stay in that Marble Arch Red Cross generally, and you could hear those things exploding around. Yeah, you know. um, we had a big water tower at our air base at Great Ashfield, and it was a kind of a square-looking thing. Uh, we had been over there very long, and this guy says, "Well, you're, they'll probably get some buzz bombs on. They got some new crews around." And sure enough, one night here, boy, they hear this old thing, chug, 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 you know, sound like an old 28 model Dodge, four cylinder, you know, just chugging along. And went out to look, and it just, the tailpipe, I think, just lit up the sky. It was kind of foggy. And it just barely missed our water tower, and it went chugging on off to the northwest. And pretty soon it went chug, chug. And the guys there says, they'd been there a while, I said, hey, hit the deck. He says, that thing's going in now. Boy, go kaboom, out someplace. They didn't know where it was going to go. You, they couldn't hardly, ah, they'd take references, radio references, you know. Mm -hmm. But that's that's about all. <laughs> now, the V2s, you could hear them coming down after they came down and blew up. You could hear the whistle from them. Oh, really? Uh-huh. Yeah, they were rare. And you just didn't know anything about what they were going to do. How did the uh, British population treat you? Great, yeah. great, yeah, oh yeah, there was this little town of Elmswell, oh, it was real neat. They're, they had a pub there that uh, those crazy British would uh, they'd drink beer, uh, they'd have a dark and a mild and, a, a, and an ale, and the, if it wasn't warm, when they get it, they'd set it on the heater and warm it up. We liked our ale, ice cold, yeah, of course no ice, but this one pub owner there at Elmswell, our squadron was right next to the town. Man, you could just walk out there about three blocks and he was in town. Uh, he put his ale shipment in, in in his well. And it was, well, water's pretty cool, you know. So uh, he'd always keep a, keep some for us down there. <laughs> he got acquainted with all of us that lived there pretty close to town. But, uh, yeah, the British were uh, they pretty good, eh? They were. I was glad that they were, because it would have been pretty rough trying to get along with somebody that didn't give a hoot about you, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, they realized we were there to help get things back to normal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were you uh, were you single or were you married during the war? I, I was I was married whenever I went over, just mm -hmm. before I went over. 
Yeah, in October of uh, 44, married the first week in October, and uh, two weeks later, well, I was on my way then to uh, basically to England because we went to Savannah, and then uh, we went on over. Mm -hmm. Did you did you keep in touch through letters while you were over there with your wife? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we could send it. Uh, Email. Now, not yeah, <laughs> yeah, not, right. not this kind of email yeah. they have now. That that little field uh, that you could uh, write, and it had to be censored. Everything was censored. Mm -hmm. And uh, oh yeah, was, she's got a, a letter. I think it was maybe two of them that I didn't get any mail after that uh, midair. And uh, even the post office had stamped it missing in action and hadn't sent it back yet. But I had gone there and made a uproar. Uh, I wasn't getting any mail. And they said, Look, I said, Well, heck, you, you're missing. I said, No, I'm not. And I thought, Oh, well. And so they, they gave me then her letters that uh, they'd already stamped and read missing in action. I was getting ready to send them back. Wow. <laughs> Uh, so how uh, you flew in B seventeens? Um, what was what was that plane like to fly in? You know, how was they, did it take battle damage? Well, oh yeah, you could that thing could be, it could actually fly on two engines. We flew one of our missions. Uh, I, I guess I failed to mention there. I had been shot down twice. Um, first time I shot down, uh, we were. Went, I think it was Munich, and was shot up real bad with flak. And uh, we started straggling, and uh, we got back, and we were hoping we went back past where the lines were. And uh, now this wasn't with my crew, I was with another crew. And uh, we took some small arms fire, and I, we were sure then that that was about where the line was. So we were still, oh, a couple of thousand feet. But uh, we couldn't get our gear down. Uh, we had lost hydraulics. Uh, we couldn't do a lot of things. We were just really putting along, uh, losing altitude all the time. And saw this little airfield. And the pilot says, I'm we're going to go in here. She says, we're not going to be able to bail out over uh, friendly territory. He says, we're, just, we're going to have to go in. And we think we're in behind the lines. We're okay. So he did his damnedest. And both of them, he and the co-pilot, they got that aircraft down on the ground. And uh, without hurting any of us. And... Uh, that aircraft didn't fly anymore, but it, it tore up in pretty good shape. But it was only on running on, th three engines were running. One was dead, one was almost dead, but it was still running a little bit. And the second time we went down, I was with my crew. We went into, uh, um, we got hit by the flak pretty good and lost a lot of fuel. Even though our tanks were self sealing it, we still lost an awful lot of fuel. We were flying on two engines and we'd thrown out everything. Everything that we could shake loose, we threw it out to lighten. And we made it back to uh, uh, Dover, just Dover. And it was the RAF base, Lancaster base. And uh, that aircraft flew again. We landed, landed great. And uh, uh, then they came and got it later, you know. When you were on your first time, you described being shot out, you were behind friendly lines then, right? We were, yeah, we were in friendly territory. We, we were um, five, five or six miles due east of Reims, France. And Reims had been a, that little airfield had been a, a what do they call it, a medium bomber. I guess they'd fly um, medium bombers out of it. And... Uh, it had been in our hands for a while because they had some B-25s and some B-26s there. Mm -hmm. 
and the Germans have been using something, using something else with it. But anyway, uh, it was a short field. We knew we couldn't land anything. We couldn't get the wheels down. We couldn't even crank them down, let alone uh, bring them down electrically because the electric power was basically gone. So you belly landed then? Huh? So you did a belly landing? Yeah, we slid in and tore it up, but, uh, but nobody got hurt. What was that like, being inside the, a plane uh, belly landing? It, not, not too great. You couldn't tell. Uh, you could tell it was on the ground, and you could tell it was different. <laughs> it, the ball tore, bounced up inside the everything and poked the post that it's hooked to, poked it through the top. Uh, it tore it up pretty good. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it ever flew again. They, and I know it didn't. They used it for parts. Mm -hmm. And it took us two days then to get back to our base. We hitched a ride uh, on, a, on a British lorry going back to Paris, and we went back, back to Orly and took a C-47 then back to the base. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got about five minutes left on the tape. Um, I guess, uh, real quickly, I just want to touch on, um, did you have fighter escorts sometimes? Yeah, we've got guys? escorts, yeah. Oh, P-51s yeah. or P-47s? Both. Which ones did you prefer? 51s. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. 47s were um, uh, great for uh, uh, groundwork, they found out. Uh, they were not maneuverable. Uh, on on fighters on uh, as the P P fifty one was, mm -hmm. but so yeah, P fifty ones were. They got to doing that uh, escort when they got the disposable drop tanks. Mm -hmm. P fifty one kept had two because it had a radiator underneath. P forty seven had one big one. They'd fly on those until they would be jumped or find opportunity of target, and then they would just drop them because they were cardboard anyway. You see. But they'd use out of them and then use out of the main tanks the rest of the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, um, you know, looking back on your experience in World War II and the missions you flew, did did all that experience have an impact on you? Well, it's bound to have. I don't know uh, what it uh, uh, to really put it in words what it did, but um, yeah. It sure made an impression, all right. Uh, I tried to forget, uh, and did, for so long until uh, not so long ago, five, six, seven year, uh, years ago, when my uh, two daughters, which are school teachers, wanted to know what I did they, uh, in service. And so I've been slowly but surely trying to put down on paper my memoirs, as you might say, and uh, to their... Push, push, push. <laughs> so, but I don't know what, what it had, how it had changed me or anything, whether it ever did. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, you sure look at things a heck of a lot different. Mm -hmm. um, did it change your perceptions of the military at all? No. Uh, I, if I thought I could have made a living at it, uh, I probably would have stayed in. Um, I liked the military, and uh, I liked the Air Force, mm -hmm. and um, I would have really liked to have got a tour as in the Blue Air Force. Mm -hmm. That was a real, the real Air Force, not the Army's Air Force, <laughs> but uh, I didn't get to. Uh, I was called f up for the Korean, but I had uh, acquired some baggage, uh, some dependents, uh, and uh, so they said no. Uh, if they needed me on my MOS number, uh, they'd, give me, they'd call me later. They never did. Um, well, we've got about three minutes left. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing for anybody who may be watching this at some point? Anything you'd like to pass on to anybody else? Words of wisdom? <laughs> no, I have no wisdom. <laughs> I, no, I don't think so. I don't... Uh, it's just that uh, I'm glad I was. That was I was in that era because it has. It was really an era of our our form of gov government salvation. Um, I would hate to th thought about what would have happened if the war hadn't gone our, our way, but um, 
it did, and uh, for whatever reason, um, uh, it has worked. Mm -hmm. I don't like to put anything else with it. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, um, I guess in closing, I'd like to thank you for letting me interview you here. You're quite welcome. And um, I appreciate your service to the country, as is everybody um, that's ever w will watch this tape. Um, and um, 30 missions is quite a feat, you know, <laughs> oh, yeah. and uh, so I assume you're one of the members of the, the, the Lucky Bastards Club, right? That's right. Yeah, <laughs> I sure am. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, I mean, that, that poem that, that, that is the Lucky Bastards Club says it all, doesn't it? It sure does. And uh, it, it's, it don't pull any punches. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, if you have nothing else to say, I'll go ahead and stop the interview here. Right. Okay. Thank you. You bet.